We are so happy to welcome our last speaker, Mr. Rohit Sinha. It's an evening there, so but I'm so glad that you are here with us when at least here where I am, it's still sunlight, although I'm in this black cubicle. But anyway, uh, Rohit will be opening up the curtain covering SRE or Site Reliability Engineering, which according to, for example, Kahne is the next big thing and works just fine with DevOps. So stay tuned and listen to this. Rohit will be talking about elephants. Ah, meaning those culturally monolithic organizations and how to transform them into one with site, re site reliability engineering culture. We will be hearing about SRE's data-driven journey throughout the teams and organization up till implementation. Rohit is a keen innovator and a great listener, which is an amazing talent. So, but this time, let us hear him now talk and we listen. We'll practice that one. Thank you so much, Rohit, for being here and please welcome. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Um, thank you for introdu introducing me, uh, Maria. And uh, yeah, I think it was a very interesting discussion. And I'll start from exactly uh, what um, Adam was talking about uh, previously about, uh, you know, difficulty in trying to change the culture uh, and also trying to bring in newer things while people say, you know, this is, an, this is not broken. So why do you want to fix it? Yeah, something of that sort. Never mind. So from a transformation and cultural shift using site reliability engineering. Uh, to start with, I'm going to cover a little bit about SRE, uh, site reliability engineering. I'll be using SRE uh, most of the times. Uh, I'll, I'll give a very brief about what is SRE, what are the driving principles, how uh, we perceive uh, as an organization and how we try to use this in our journey and how we try to take a little bit of a leaf out of data science and trying to mingle it with site reliability engineering and the methodologies which are followed in there, right? So to start with, um, SRE, what is it actually? Uh, well, it was coined by Google, Penn's Law's coined the term. Uh, it's for the reliability, uh, which we should talk about. It Site reliability engineering focuses on reliability engineering. A lot of questions are, you know, you know, revolving around what is SRE? Is it same as DevOps? Well, I think uh, uh, somebody also talked about why is it separate out? Well, it is not, but a lot of people still have that confusion. Is it same as DevOps? Is it only supposed to do automations? How do I measure I'm in the right direction? These are some of the questions uh, which we go around when we talk about site reliability engineering. To put it in simple terms, uh, site reliability engineers often have backgrounds in software engineering. We focus on providing reliability through automation, system design, or any of those uh, perspective. But in a nutshell, if you can put it, how do how about putting a hardcore developer into an ops world separately? Uh, you know, give him the ops jobs which are being done in a very traditional monolithic approach, and ask him, okay, do you how do you want to change this? How do you want to remove that interrupt driven culture because it's very procedure oriented, procedure based setup which is done using um, in, in a traditional uh, um, operations setup, which at least I'm going to give an example about from our organization, how did we try to transform it? As said, it's a never ending journey and uh, it is much more than actually looking at DevOps. It is much more than actually looking at technology. It is much more uh, than looking at new tools and open source and so on and so forth. It is what it is. It is about cultural shift. It is about trying to build a team of X where we can accept failure, trying to build a system which is about reliability, where we can have a place to experiment. It is about an analogy of asking, you know, software engineering to do operations from a focus on automation. It is also to do about, uh, you know, work about how do we get closer to the operations from an engineering standpoint. Often we do have different sort of teams, one who does operations, one who does engineering, unless and until you are in a proper, uh, I will not even say cutting edge, even a bleeding edge technology. Uh, these two are very separate and they run in a very separate uh, thought process. Okay. There are, uh, you know, it is about 
system building it is about measuring success it is about always looking at kpis from a perspective of are we green in everything and so on and so forth well the sre thought process from a transformation standpoint literally cuts through it what it does is it wants to go in a cultural shift where it is not interrupt driven anymore it goes into a cultural shift where it is about measuring the success not measuring the failures not measuring the key performance uh, you know indicators but measuring the success how much are we improving rather than saying oh we we did this well last month we didn't do this well this month no that's not the point the point is how we are better improving it's a mindset which changes uh, all together you know you custom design central link log monitoring based dashboard that's where we use a lot of uh, you know data analytics based setup which can be put in to enable sres now what i call site reliability engineers in an organization are are like soldiers and when you when you put soldiers on the battlefield you don't give them knives and uh, you know uh, you know swords in this age you give them sophisticated weapons to fight right and that is what we try to achieve when we say about using the data and the concept of visibility engineering which we want to talk about uh, as well as a transformation driver technology refresh i think i am stressed enough on it there is a big big part of doing a modernization on reliability first approach we have all these buzzwords in the industry talking about ai um, machine learning and and all of that how can we actually utilize it do a real time analytics rather than doing a reactive based approach having a tools factory have obviously use of open source goes without saying and the fourth most important point is actually looking at the process part of doing things actually looking at the simplicity nobody is saying it is wrong everybody is saying can it be enhanced even further okay and then you know maybe the holy grail would be a self healing methodology where we can go and try doing that but that's that's far fetched and i'm talking from a uh, from an organization which is into services based setup now services based is quite different you have different customers all customers some big small large different specifications different setup right and it is sometimes very difficult to have a site reliability engineering concept which is one size fits all it doesn't work that way because we have different uh, you know contracts which run through so how do we manage all of these complexity together using site reliability engineering is something which we'll talk about before that let's talk a little bit about the reliability principles which are there uh, from site reliability engineering very quickly we'll go through uh, them number one is from a cultural aspect embrace risk we have to embrace risk and try to manage it we have to have a tolerance limit of of trying to be uh, you know trying to do things which which have not been done before trying to take that risk everybody is keen on from a customer standpoint yeah we are all in green because this is what is contractually obligated but the point is if we are always on the contractual obligation how are we going to try doing different things uh and and not worry too much about the failure part of things so we have to have a mechanism in place to have a risk tolerance then you have the error budget concept which is for me the most important of all these principles because that's where you measure you measure your disruptions you measure how well you are going you measure how you go uh, along as you are doing the improvements uh it's a concept from error budget where you provide an error budget concept uh, to the teams and then ask them you know you got to follow this for example we have uh you have been doing a certain task or a certain change pretty well why don't we give you some credit points and if you screw it up next time i'm sure we are going to deduct your points and if you keep on screwing it for a couple of times and hitting the threshold you will have to go through an entire quality gate and go back to the old processes which were there you know uh, a thought which we brought in into our thought process managing toil um, again it was stressed upon uh, in some of the sessions earlier how do you manage toil toil uh, from a perspective of how much effort is being spent manual effort which is being spent on a lot of critical mundane task and how we can look at uh, you know trying to automate it monitoring another key aspect from a reliability perspective because uh, reliability can only be seen if we try to read data well when we say monitoring it's about the traditional monitoring which is already in place and also about getting into more details of how we can look at monitoring by doing data analytics looking at digging the gold mine of logs which you are sitting on trying to figure out things which is not visible to the naked eye automation 
Well, automation is is probably the most overused word in the industry because everybody wants to automate. Some of them think it as a holy grail where you put it in and it just works well. Well, it is not. It is just an output. It is the last thing which you do after doing every other thing because that's the output. This is this is what you have to do at the end of it. So you reach that phase and then you do the automation. The real crux is before that. What do we need to automate is very important. Uh, and the value which it brings after that. Release engineering, uh, more inclined towards the DevOps uh, setup where we have, you know, it should be the second step for any monolithic uh, big elephant type of organization. Um, and, uh, you know, should be the second step where you can actually bring in all the concepts and the practices in. And the last important thing is simplicity. We are not going to solve world hunger problem in one shot, so let's not look at complex solutions. Let's try to build small, uh, systematic solutions and bring a little bit of method to the madness which we have around. So the price of reliability is the per pursuit of the utmost simplicity. That's that's how it should be quoted, right? Uh, again, a different view to that. Uh, you, how do you embrace risk uh, that bring the culture that can be embedded into error budgeting? Then you, how do you manage that toil by putting that error budgeting? Because if you start following the error budget and see the improvement, you start looking at reducing toil. When you start looking at reducing toil, your, 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 your engineers are going to have much more time to do a lot more automation. And uh, you know you build a more, more sophisticated monitoring, centralized log-based analysis, which I'm going to talk about in some time, uh, which we tried to develop. And it is also slowly being rolled out um, across the organization. And finally, the automation part of things where you use data ops, AI ops, and all of those uh, you know, capabilities which can be built in. Now, how did we achieve this? Okay. Now, as an organization, when we talk about cultural shift uh, and obviously the technology which comes with that, the cultural shift can only be achieved if you have deeper penetration in the organization. Now, I, if I can talk about roughly the type of business we have, we have close to more than 100 odd customers running across the globe. We have different teams, same services, different catalogs, different uh, you know contracts, uh, and and different at times very different services as well. So how do you bring in that culture? Because again, no one size will fit all. So we came it with a concept of horizontal enablement of SRE and the vertical enablement of SRE. Now, when you see on the screen, you have the vertical enablement. What do we mean by vertical enablement? That means we ensured that we go to a point where each and every tribe delivering service should have an SRE, a qualified SRE in there, because that's how the penetration is going to be. And then we set up a very thin layer on top, which we call the horizontal SRE or the bootstrap SRE, we call it, where we have those SREs who are like an ideological mentor to all the SREs who are working on each and every team, each and every tribe going forward. Right, so that we have maximum penetration. What do the, what is their job to ensure that there is a reliability, uh, you know, principles being followed at the ground most level, and it is not about cultural. We have the co cases of blameless postmortems; those are for real. We have to get into a culture where we talk about acceptance of failure, embracing of risk, and not being always reactive based on that. So that was the job of the horizontal SRAs. And at the same time, these SREs, they were some of them were picked from uh, from the industry by our organization to ensure and help us in taking this through in our journey. Uh, software tools and visibility engineering, these were the two focus areas because if we have a very strong visibility engineering setup, which means we are looking at things with a greater visibility, even doing prediction-based analysis, predictive uh, maintenance and all, we need to have that setup in place. It's like the ammunitions which you provide to the SRS to do really the work which is required, right? Not only the, the 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 cultural shift, but also the technology shift or the observability shift which we are looking forward to. And that's what we try to do. Some of the examples of doing correlation, like on the top, if you see, we have some uh, you know predictions on some of the matrices which we have. The orange line talks about the prediction. The blue line talks about what actually happened. We have the error trends which are coming in both from an ITSM-based data and also from the logs data and on a major correlation matrix which we put in place to actually start predicting what will happen. And we and, and, and later, I'm also going to talk about how we put it into day-to-day -day working. Because merely making 
new stuff and putting tools in place is not going to really talk about what is called as visibility and you know they are your your transformation is done it has to be adopted it has to be used it has to be put into the process of working of each and every team which is in there right so we had to do that this was the visibility engineering architecture which we put in place from different data sources uh, trying to do the screaming we were using some of the tools like kafka to to move it now there are two aspects to this uh, number one is obviously the log based data which comes in the second is our um, you know our our data which comes in from our itsm itl based tooling you know incident management change management problem management and all of that which comes in from an organization standpoint and that data will help us define what should be the error budget um, for each of the teams so there were error budgets defined for each team each tribe which was delivering services so that we get to a point where we know exactly how much it will fail yes it is a humongous ex exercise it's it, it took maybe even months and years to get to that uh, and then defining specific uh, needs for their correlation and new tech monitoring or visibility engineering setup for them because again as i said i'm str i cannot stress enough on the fact that every team was different right every challenge was different every customer was different every you know team working processes were different so we had to be very uh, meticulous in going to each and every tribe and trying to define their error budget and at the same time the the sres in the team and the horizontal sres were constantly pushing to adopt uh, you know the sre principles going forward hi we are ethicode and we organize the devops conference Regardless of where you are on your DevOps transformation journey, we would love to have a chat with you and help with your next steps. We have seen many examples of what successful DevOps transformations look like. You can find us at ethico.com. The links are in the description. And have a great time with the DevOps conference talks. Before I go ahead with this, I also want to talk about a little bit on data science. Uh, how did we do it? I don't have to tell you, you know, data is the new oil. Everybody knows that, yeah. The first stage was obviously ITSM analysis. We put in a machine learning based setup to what the problem is rather than where the problem is. In a classic case the, of problem management, we get a lot of details when we see a trend going on the historic data. And then we ask our SMEs to, you know, look into, dig into it and do it. How about providing that analysis real time in front of them so that they exactly know what the problem is rather than looking at okay there is a problem we need to do further analysis to get it we wanted to make them nimble we wanted to make them quick and that was the reason and the second stage was obviously itsm static threshold data which is based on log analytics as a dynamic threshold now this is a paradigm shift uh, from what we are trying to do and and to be very honest we have still not achieved 100% in the second part which is about enhanced analytics and the usage and each and every team yeah the adoption is painfully slow i'll be very honest uh, the reason for that is we are trying to change the process the teams have been working. Yes, we have been providing brilliant services to our customers, clients across the globe for years. But that does not mean it is the most efficient or the best way to do it. Yes, it is the most reliable way to do it because that's how we know to do it. But making these predictions, showing them a trend. I'm just taking an example of many examples which we have. How do we inculcate into a team? How do we ask the team, okay, this is the new way of your working because they are, most of them are very service oriented. I mean, uh, you know, SOP based work, which is like you, are, you have each and every line item defined, this is how you're gonna work. So that was one part. The second part was today we rely a lot on alerting uh, systems, right? Uh, be it application infrastructure, you, you name it everywhere, right? That's all based on static thresholds. We are talking here about predictions. That means those are dynamic thresholds, okay? Now, to imagine a scenario in this case where I know based on my conditions, which I see on the screen, based on my algorithms, which have been put in from a data science perspective, we know that something is going to go wrong in say 10 hours from now or eight hours from now based on my correlation. How do we tackle it? Do we ask our uh, ops team who are working on it to just quickly go and try to fix it? Do I get my DevOps team to start running some stuff so that we can quickly push it through the pipeline? or do we ask our SREs to really jump in there, make a quick, uh, you know, quick uh, problem assessment and try to solve the problem in 80% of the time what is left for the crash to happen? Just giving an example, right? So if it is 10 hours, we run a project for 10 hours, 70% of the time to ensure 
which is led by the way by the site reliability engineer to ensure that the trend starts coming down if it does not come down then we go into our uh, age old quality based security based setup but that's how we try to look at these dynamic thresholds it's like a moving average game right you never know when it's going to go down or go up sometimes yes i agree this is mathematics it can go wrong it can go right i'm not denying that fact but at times uh you know you can have 80% or 90% uh, uh, accuracy but uh, most of the times it has worked really hard now adopting this real way of working and considering the cost which is associated with trying to do this um is is tricky we have to look at risk and reward and figure out uh, is it applicable for all the teams uh, or if it can be done for you know the most important customers so that's why i say it's still a work in progress we have totally not adopted it but this is the idea we want to really change the face of how the processes have been working all these years versus how we want it to work using some of this cutting edge data analytics setup from an observability standpoint and utilizing the and harnessing the skills of real SREs which who are present in the organization and who are trying to you know do this now challenges well not one many transformations always have challenges yeah <laughs> so uh when we put it in front of the board there were a lot of questions asked and it took us a lot of time for people to really understand and harness yeah there is a transformation which is required and internally we have to do it uh instrument of gratification absolutely not it is not an instrument of gratification it is a journey and this journey is going to be uh sometimes painful sometimes joyous but it's a journey uh inculcating the culture of failure and not chase numbers i mean we love all of us love kpis yeah no doubt in that fact from a service uh, management perspective we look at green and we feel happy yeah everything is stable um and that's where the culture of failure was was an issue uh, the acceptance was an issue governance i think we have talked a lot about it uh, taking in mind uh, trying to you know uh, negate the risk which the organization comes up with analytics uh, 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 analytics of data only from itsm problem management perspective that has to change we talk about log based analysis predictions and all non technology centric approach um, you cannot do the same thing what we did with 20 year old tool or 25 year old tool right we need to have newer technologies in place the embracement has to happen and that was my question in the last one how did you try to do it uh, to adam as well yeah uh, not ready to take tearing bold decisions yes sometimes you got to take bold decisions all right we are going to junk this we are going to do this or not and not making continuous uh, attempt for error budget concept uh, the moment you see uh, an escalation from a customer side uh, a lot of teams just wanted to junk this error budget concept and go back to the ways they were working before and that is a total failure for a transformation which we have been trying to achieve so we had to negate all of these challenges at some point or the other uh in our journey um and yeah it's a journey it's still going on and uh, hopefully uh, we have been able to turn the wheel to be very honest uh, but we still have some work to do so i'll stop here uh, for taking any questions uh, if there are yep we have a couple of questions but please keep them rolling in in the q and a if there's something you want to ask the first i actually want to ask is from Maria, because it's an excellent question. And I'd just like to know your one hint on how to tackle the elephant, the monolithic culture. Well, I think uh, there's no one solution to it, to be very honest, Darren, <laughs> yeah, or uh, whoever asked the question. Yeah, the, the, the one way to do it is we have to show them a value. And that value cannot be instant. As I said, instant gratification. You have, the value has to be on an ROI basis. it has to be return on investment and it will not happen overnight so we cannot make false promises that i'm going to change the world in one day yeah that's not going to happen so we have to be very realistic meticulous and the most important thing which i learned from all of this uh, and i even my, myself did that mistake when we designed it for the first time was uh, we cannot have one size fit all so you don't come up with standard you know guidelines and say okay this has to be followed every every team have different challenges even if they are providing the same service right we have to get to that detail it is a difficult task but we have to get to the detail of what is the real crux and the need we got to engage with them and come out with their thought process and then try to
put it into the puzzle of how we want to do the transformation for me that's the only answer which i can give uh, from a perspective of how do we do it yeah okay that sounds good one of the question we had was how do you suggest promoting the idea of your first step of embracing risk in environments with a low risk tolerance for example as we were just discussing with adam moss with pensions information very low risk tolerance there so what ideas would you have on on embracing risk in those situations uh see i mean again i mean uh, what we did i can give an example of that as well yeah uh we have to start with uh, obviously pilots there is there's no second thought to it and those pilots have to be lo uh, looked at the services which are at lower risk because that's when the when when the service owners we don't own the uh, the contract with the customers the guys who are facing the customers do right and they are the ones who take the brunt also it's not us from a transformation standpoint right so we have to take that into account we have to convince them that it this works okay and for that we have to do um, pilots uh, mostly on lower risk services first to show that yeah this actually works or a similar one and then uh, and also you have to relate it to the customer benefits yeah let's be honest we do a transformation internally what is in there for the end user right what are they gaining out of it and we have to transform that as well for example when you put an error budget in place uh, you look at some areas which you want to improve right those should be related to the customer so that they can see a value in it not just merely our numbers uh, internally as a transformation organization right but overall so these are some of the ways in which we try to do it uh, i'll be honest again here some of the teams have still not adopted it in our organization i'll be very honest in that uh, because that's a journey as i said yeah they will be convinced it will take some time but this is the way forward and also we have to be competitive uh, let me be very honest we are in services industry which is very cutthroat at times yeah and if we are not constantly innovating or providing new ways of doing things we won't be able to sustain um, you know for for long and the customer also looks at it they always have an option of going with somebody else yeah so we have to show them a customer value at the same time trying to put in that risk uh, based analysis and say yeah this is how we can do it and also there is another way in which you we have done it in some of the managed services contracts which is you know relatively easier is is the fact that uh you put an error budget which is much above the static threshold of slas or uh, you know the contracts which we have so that even if it drops it doesn't drop to the point where it actually starts hurting your image as an organization you try to do it above that so you have one threshold you try to reach one threshold then you go above that and try to reach another threshold and even if you fall through you don't reach there but that's very case to case basis um you know uh you have to first convince um, our stakeholders that yes this actually works and it can only happen when you go out of the ppt world into the real world and show them something which is working okay that sounds good we might have one more question let me just check with the boss whether we have time for it maria how are we doing on time okay so, i'm sure we can take just a quick answer okay quick answer i'll try <laughs> i mostly just want to kind of turn your question to adam back on you actually so how do you address the mindset change around this new tooling, new tech, and SRE at this execution level? Painful is the one word. <laughs> <right>? <laughs> uh, that's why I asked that question, to be honest. It's painful. It is excruciating at times because uh, it's like hitting a wall most of the times and you are not getting any response back from it. And at times you might get frustrated about it. But remember one thing it is the right way of doing it and slowly or surely people will uh, you know admit to that um, because even they work through and that's why these uh, tools are i mean i got one answer once from one of the stakeholders who said you know what uh, this uh, open source tool i will not name the tool but this open source tool nobody uses it and my question was very simple it's not that nobody uses it it's just that we don't know how to use it the entire world uses it that's the uh, that's the simple answer which i had yep excellent thank you very that. good thank you so much rohit